In chapter seven, we need to move away from a discrete distribution and towards continuous distributions. So let's ponder that for just a second with this example. So suppose we are gonna roll dice with more and more and more sides. So you have a four-sided die, pretend that the sides are zero, 25, 50, and 75. Then you have a 10-sided die, a 20-sided die, and a 100-sided die. The following shows the empirical distributions, probability distributions for each die. And you can see I ran a simulation here. So you can see what's happening. So you have four bars for your four-sided die, you have 10 bars for your 10-sided die, and so on. And you finally get down here to the 100-sided die. What shape, roughly, do each of these graphs have? Well, it's been a while since we've seen this shape, so let me remind you from the chapter two notes in here. We have learned about skewed right and skewed left shapes, the symmetric bell shape, kind of lovely. But there's another symmetric shape that we learned about in chapter two, which is the uniform shape. And that's where everything is roughly the same. And if you have a fair die, then they would be roughly the same. So this would be uniform. And that would be, make sense because if the, die, if the dice are fair, then each side should occur in approximately the same proportion. as every other side, right? And that's what a uniform distribution is. It's when all of the bars are roughly the same. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that there isn't a bit of variability, but even this one over here with the 100 side of die, it looks like they're really far apart, but you see that the high points are like 1.3% and the low points are about 0.9%, 0.8%. Those aren't actually that far apart from each other. And if you roll the die more and more and more, those bars will get more and more close together. Of course, the graphs are not perfect because these came from actual rolling of the dice. They came from empirical data, or in this case, actually simulations. There we go. We found them empirically from simulation data. Therefore, they will not match the classical probability values, but they'll be close, or they should be close. They should be close as long as the simulator is fair or the die is fair. All right, so what is the approximate empirical probability of rolling a zero on the 10-sided die? So let's go back here and look at the 10-sided die. And we have the sides zero through, um, I think it's zero, 10, 20, and so on. There they are, zero, 10, 20. So the zero is right here on that first bar so it's right below the 10%. So nine would be about halfway. So that's about 9.7, 9.8%. So let me type that up. I'll make it 9.8%, which would be 0 0.00, or excuse me, 0 0.098. There we go, I got that typed up. All right, now what is the approximate prob empirical probability of rolling a zero on the 100 sided die? So let me go here to the 100 sided die, and you can see zero is that first bar. So it'll be, looks like it's right below the 1%, so maybe 0 point, 0.9 maybe. So let me write that up. But it's a 0.9% because it says percent over on the left hand side, so it's about 0.9%, which is about 0 0.009. And of course, we're estimating here. We don't know exactly. We're just estimating. Now, what do you know about the bars each of the graphs above? How are the bars width affected as the number of sides increases? Okay, well, we know because these are probability distributions that in each one of these four graphs, the probabilities must add to 1. So the bars must sum to 1. The bar areas must sum to 1. And then you'll notice as the number of sides is increasing, the bars are getting narrower and narrower and narrower, right? So let me write that up. There we go. As the number of sides slash bars increase, the bar widths become narrower and smaller and smaller. All right. Now what? What would happen if to the graph if we imagined a 500-sided die, a 10,000-sided die? Well, the bars would get so narrow that it would basically start approximating a curve. So I'm going to put that in. There we 
Here we go. So the bars would become so narrow that the graph would look more and more and more like a continuous curve rather than segmented histogram bars. So that's what we put down here. So as the sample size increases, um, in this case, the number of sides in the die, but I mean, whatever, the probability distribution bars, histogram bars, get narrower and narrower. That means the discrete probability distribution is becoming more and more continuous. It's becoming more and more like a continuous line rather than segmented bars. The probability of any one side being rolled is getting smaller and smaller. We saw that. So for example, it went from 9.8% on a 10-sided die to 0.9% on a 100-sided die. This means that the probability of any one side, of any one value, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. The total area of the entire curve must be equal to 1, regardless of the size of n. has to be. All right, so that's an important little concept that we've just explained here, that if you take a discrete probability distribution and you start segmentizing it enough, if you make your sample size get large enough, then your distribution becomes more and more and more continuous. And the area under the entire curve, however, has to stay one. So the chances of any one particular value get smaller and smaller and smaller. The curve becomes more like a continuous curve rather than histogram bars. And the area under the whole thing must be one. And this idea is how we're going to change from discrete distributions, which was chapter six, into continuous distributions, which is from chapter seven and beyond. We want to work with things that are have curves rather than histograms or have lines as kind of like an algebraic function would look like rather than segmented histogram bars. Now let's move into our first continuous curve, which is the uniform probability distribution. Now the probability distribution function is any, or probability density function, is an equation that's used to compute probabilities of continuous random variables. It has to satisfy the following properties, i.e. the function must be continuous, obviously, since this is a continuous distribution. The area under the whole curve must be equal to 1, always, because it's a probability distribution. The height of the graph of the equation must be greater than or equal to 0 for all values. In other words, you can never have negative probability values. The probability that a random variable is between a and b is equal to the area under the density function bounded by a and b. Now, that sounds really complicated, but it's actually pretty much what you were already doing with discrete probability histograms for the most part, um, with a couple interesting exceptions, which we'll talk about. So let's suppose you have a cable repair person that could show up at any minute, any minute in a two-hour period, say from 3 to 5 p.m. Now, why is that uniform? A uniform probability distribution. That's because the repair person could show up at any minute. This means that all minutes are equally likely, right? But time is continuous. I'm going to put that in. But time is continuous and therefore this is a continuous distribution, right? which makes it uniform. When every single moment is just as likely as every other moment, that's a continuous uniform distribution. Now what does it look like? Well, it's going to be very, very simple. Let me draw a picture of it for you. There I have it. This is a uniform distribution. You have your lower end at 3. Let me kind of zoom in so you can see it. You have your lower end at 3. You have your upper end at 5. And it's every single moment is equally likely. So it, every single second is just as high as every other second. That's why the bar goes straight across. Now, when you do this, you have to figure out your height. You can see I figured it out as 1 over 120. Now, how did I do that? Well, oh, and don't mind the shading in there. The shading isn't required yet. That's for the problem right below. So for this portion, all you really need is the, the big rectangle, but without the little shaded extra part. Matter of fact, let me make the shaded extra part go away one second. There we have it. It's all gone. Okay, so this whole rectangle, that's the uniform distribution. It's technically the function in between. 
Now, how do I figure out the height? Well, remember that I know that the area of a rectangle is base times height. And I know that the area of this particular rectangle is 1 because it's a probability distribution. So therefore, the area must add up to 1. For the same reason that the areas of the bars on these histograms have to add up to 1, that entire rectangle's area must add up to 1. So I know that. And then I know that it's talking about minutes in a 3, to, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. time. That's 120 minutes total. It's two hours, so 120 minutes. To solve this for h, I just divide both sides by 120, and I get that h, which is the height of your rectangle, is 1 over 120, and that's where I got the 1 over 120 over here. All right, and yes, you must show that, and you must label it when you do this. There, and I put in the h value so you can see it. All right, now the shading part is getting at the whole, the probability that a random variable between A and B is the equal to the area under the density function bounded by A and B. So that sounds really complicated, but it's actually quite simple. What is the probability that the cable repair person shows up between the 10th and 25th minute? So what you do is you take 310, that's the 10th minute, 325, that's the 25th minute, and you shade the area in between. That area in between is your probability. You just have to figure it out. Okay, well, it's the area of a rectangle, so this should be pretty easy to figure. Area of a rectangle is base times height. Oops, I just made that go away, so I'm going to bring it back. So I want area of the small rectangle, I want base times height. So the base I know is 15 minutes long because 325, 310 to 325 is a 15 minute period. And the height I just figured out was 1 over 120. So I could multiply those two with a calculator, let's say. 15 times 1 divided by 120 and I get 0.125. And that's the area and therefore that's the probability. So the probability is the area. When you're finding the area in between those two values, you are finding the probability, which quite frankly is not that different from what we were doing in chapter six. All right, now what is the probability that the table prepare person shows up at exactly four o'clock? Well, that's a little bit of a trick question. Four o'clock is this line down the center, but it's a line. Lines don't have an area. They don't have a shading that you can give it which means that the answer is actually zero because any one second, any one instant has no width to it, right? It has no width, therefore it has zero probability, zero chance. So it's a little bit of a trick question. Now, if I had said, if I had written four o'clock to 401, ah, then the probability would be one over 120. Well, it would be, 1 times 1 over 120, which is 1 over 120. But that's not what I said. I didn't say shows up in the minute between 4 o'clock and 401. I said shows up exactly at 4 o'clock, period, on the dot, no decimal places. But that's impossible because this is a continuous distribution, so I don't have a way to deal with that. So the answer to that is zero. There is no chance because that would be a, a line right down the center of this graph, not a bar down the center of the graph, not a shaded area, a line. And a line has no area. All right, we're done with our uniform distribution example. And we're going to take these ideas and use them with a more powerful curve than the uniform distribution curve, namely the normal curve. And I'll see you back here for that in the next video.